We're in lesson number 10 of Forerunners of the Faith. Lesson number 10, this will be a part three, and we're on section five, which is John Calvin and the glory of God. So we've been talking about the Protestant Reformation. We focused mainly on Martin Luther, who is the one who, you might say, started the Reformation. But now we're looking at the man, the next generation of Reformation leadership, and this is uh, probably the most hated man in church history. I mean, not by everyone, obviously. There's many Christians who love and uh, revere John Calvin, but he is a very polarizing figure. So, John Calvin and the glory of God, section number five. You found it? Yes. Okay. It says, Calvin was born in France in 1509. He was 25 years younger than Luther. As such, Calvin represents the second generation of Protestant reformers. Calvin was converted in the early 1530s. Like Luther, he had been studying to be a lawyer before God changed the course of his life. When persecution against Protestants erupted in France, Calvin fled to Switzerland. In Basel, he penned his first edition of the Institutes of the Christian Religion. It was published in 1536. Now, who has read, I'm not gonna ask who's read Calvin's Institutes because it's very rare to find someone who's read the whole thing. Who has read at least a little bit? You, you've read yeah. some? Okay. Who has at least heard of Calvin's Institutes? Raise your hand. How many have no idea? what this is okay so almost half and half uh, so yeah I, Martin Luther is the name most everybody knows but Calvin he yeah he's the second generation and he's known for his institutes and then something that has endured that just about every uh, modern Christian has at least heard of the five points of Calvinism which we may or may not get into this morning depending on how fast we go so the Institutes were published in 1536. Later that same year, he was planning to travel to Strasbourg, and his journey took him through Geneva, where another reformer named William Farrell, which he lived from 1489 to 1565, he convinced Calvin to stay and help lead the Protestant church in Geneva. In 1538, Farrell and Calvin came into conflict with the city council and were forced to leave Geneva. Calvin traveled to Strasbourg where he got married and published his first commentary on the Book of Romans in his second edition of the Institutes. Uh, this is a pretty well-known uh, fact. Excuse me. Uh, Calvin wrote... I believe he wrote books and commentaries on every book of the New Testament except for one. Who knows what was the one book he did not write a commentary for? Revelation. Revelation, yeah, right. Yeah, we, we talked about this on Wednesday night going through the book of Revelation, how it's a book that, you know, some churches just ignore it. There's a lot of churches, they've never preached a sermon. They're never going to go through Re Revelation chapter by chapter. And part of that is because they're taking the lead of Calvin. Calvin kind of left Revelation alone. So they're picking up on that and say, well, if he, if he couldn't figure it out, we'll, we'll, we'll just leave it alone as well. But, you know, we, we have a different uh, viewpoint of Revelation than most Reformed churches. But yes, Marcus. John MacArthur doesn't ignore Revelation, does he? That's true. Uh, John MacArthur is considered a Calvinist, but uh, he... He's also dispensational, so MacArthur often has gone through Revelation. So, yes, Aaron. Was Calvin not dispensational? Okay, yeah, dispensationalism really wasn't, I don't want to say it wasn't a thing, uh, but that viewpoint was a tiny, tiny minority compared to uh, Calvin. John Calvin started out like Martin Luther. He was Roman Catholic. That's how he grew up. And a lot of the reformers, I would say one problem with some of the reformers is they held on to a lot of the Catholic doctrine, like infant baptism, and that 
Roman Catholic view of the end times. So, yeah, uh, Calvin is considered reformed. So the reformed churches follow Calvin. Dispensational churches, more the Baptist churches, that's more in the line we're in. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Calvinist churches would be Reformed and or Presbyterian. But you're going to find that there, there will be Baptists and all sorts of churches that hold on to what are the, called the five points, which, again, we'll, we'll probably... Five, solas or the five points of Calvinism. The tulip. Yeah, the tulip, right. And I know I'm using some of these terms, and I, I, I can't assume that everybody knows what they mean. So if you want to ask clarification... Hopefully, it'll all come out and I'll explain it all as we go. But, uh, did you have another question? Well, no. If you have a question or comment, raise your hand. Don't okay. interrupt. Yes, thank you. <laughs> like so, I do. Yes. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Um, in the summer of 1541, Calvin returned to Geneva and he would minister there for the rest of his life. During his time in Geneva, he preached over 2,000 sermons. So I don't know if that sounds like a lot to you, but that is a lot of sermons. By 1546, Calvin began to face opposition from some of the citizens of Geneva. This opposition group, known as the Libertines, resisted Calvin in the rules that were enacted by the church in Geneva. It was not until nearly 10 years later in the mid-1550s that the opposition against Calvin finally began to wane. Uh, beginning in 1555, Calvin welcomed... Let me just stop there. The, the Libertines. Now, it doesn't, the book doesn't explain uh, what the Libertines, you know, what their issue was. There's a little hint here. But when you hear that term, term Libertines... What do you think that was? Liberty. What? Liberty. <laughs> yeah, I think of terms like hyper grace, libertine. Yeah, liberty. You hear the word liberty. So freedom. We don't like all these rules. You know, John Calvin in the church in Gene Geneva has all these rules. And I think of libertines today. Like if you go to a church and the pastor is preaching let's say from the book of 1 Corinthians, and it's in the text, like fornication, like and he's preaching against fornication. Okay, well, the Bible speaks against that. Uh, but uh, someone who is a, of a libertine mindset, all they hear is, you know, thou shalt not. There's a rule and, you know, we're free in Christ. And maybe that's not the best thing to do. They might have to admit that, okay, the Bible does say this is wrong and this is wrong, but stop weighing me down with law and commandments and rules. Yeah, so libertines tend to be, we're free in Christ and don't tell me that what I'm doing is wrong. They, they kind of bristle against Bible preaching <laughs> because they want to live their life their way and they don't want anyone telling them what to do. So what are these... Rules, man-made rules that they were fighting against, or rules from um, God's word. Well, I mean, I think they were from God's word, but there, there, you know, there, there's always those things in churches that maybe are more along the lines of tradition. So, I'm sure it was both. But people that are of that mindset, they, they do, from my experience, they do end up opposing things that are just straight up from the Bible, but yeah, Larry. For most of my life, I lived a good portion of it wanting, or not wanting to be held to the rules or to the commandments. And so, you know, I was like, oh, I'm saved by grace, so I'm free to do what I want. Mm -hmm. And I would listen to Christian radio all the time. And I'd listen to John MacArthur and I would say, because his <laughs> name of his radio program is Grace to You. Uh -huh. And so I would always I would listen and he's just really driving home the point, you know, of scripture alone and just really hammering uh, how we need to be obedient.
obedient. Right. And I was like, that doesn't sound like grace to me. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> but looking back on it, I was using God's grace as a license for me to sin. Right. And thinking, oh, all I got to do is First John 1 9. I'll confess. And so I did every night. Mm -hmm. I would confess, but there was never any repentance. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the libertines. It takes different forms uh, throughout the ages, but that's the general idea. Free in Christ, which we are free in Christ. But what is that? How do you define that? That's the kind of the sticking point. Did you have something here? I just wondered, did they call themselves libertines? Yeah. Called I'm sure they were probably called that. Because if they chose that name, that says quite a bit about them. I mean, that literature from that name, Libertines refer to drunkards and mm. people that were free with women and right. usually a man was a libertine, so you know. <laughs> right. Just in books. So I was just curious. Yeah, I was listening to a radio uh, program where they the pastor was talking about Jimmy Swagger back in what was that, the seventies, eighties. You know, he got caught with a prostitute, I believe. And he had that tearful apology on TV. And I think a lot of people wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt that he was sorry. And they forgave him, and he did end up continuing in ministry later on, which, you know, you can argue that was good or not good. But apparently, it happened again. Or there was another uh, affair or something. And when he was asked the second time or the third time he got caught, his response was, well, that's none of your business. So, I mean, there, there's two types of churches out there. There will be the type of church that says, don't judge, and we're not even going to talk about it. He's, he's under grace. Just, okay, it's not good, but we're not going to really preach against that. And then there's other churches that, that's wrong, and we need to have standards, and we're going to preach what the Bible says, and that's a, a serious sin, and he needs to step down. So most churches are going to fall on one side or the other, the, the libertine side or what I would just call the, the biblical side. <laughs> yeah. We always have to look at, instead of me looking at him and saying, wow, that's really bad, I need to look at myself and say, how am I using grace or how you know so I have to com I can't compare myself to him yeah I have to compare myself to Christ which I'll never match right but he's the only he's our example right yeah and you know and the libertines will call the other side Pharisees or whatever and you can become pharisaical when yes you point out the errors in others but you totally ignore all of your own and you're condemning others when you're doing the same thing. I mean, that, that's a problem, obviously. And there are churches that are maybe too harsh and don't show grace. But Isn't is that Romans 2.2 two, right there? Uh, what does it say? Romans 2.2. Two? Well, I'm right here, so I might as well, might as well read it. Romans 2, 2, but we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. So anyway, this is what John Calvin was dealing with in Geneva. So it says here, uh, beginning in 1555, Calvin welcomed English Protestant refugees who are fleeing from the Ro Roman Catholic Queen Mary I. Uh, to Geneva. Among them was the Scottish preacher John Knox. Uh, John Knox ended up being kind of the father of the Presbyterians. In 1558, Calvin became ill and worked quickly to finish up the final edition of his Institutes. The final version, published in 1559, expanded to 80 chapters from the original six chapters in the first edition. Calvin died on May 27, 1564. The aim of his life had been the glory of God. Though his legacy is often reduced to a few key points related to God's sovereignty and salvation, Calvin's ministry focused on the sovereign glory of God 
in everything. So they made reference here to his ministry is often reduced to what? A few, a few points. Uh, let's see, reduced to a few key points. So that, that, we'll get into this subject here. Um, this is going to take me a second to figure, figure out here. So, okay, five points of Calvinism. This is how most people uh, remember John Calvin, where they think or hear the name John Calvin. This is what they, what they think of. Before we get into this, let me just read a few quotes because, uh, yeah, the, the section is called John Calvin and the Glory of God. Here's few things that he said, the Holy Spirit has consecrated us as temples of God. We therefore must let the glory of God shine through us and we must not pollute ourselves with sin. Until men recognize that they owe everything to God, that they are nourished by his fatherly care and that he is the author of every good work, that they should seek nothing beyond him, they will never yield him willing service. Nay, unless they establish their complete happiness in him, they will never give themselves truly and sincerely to him. So John Calvin, uh, he focused on the glory of God and also the sovereignty of God. Uh, who's familiar with the five points here? Okay. Now the way I'm go going to present this as a teacher, this is Sunday school. So I'm going to present it from a, a teaching viewpoint. So I'm going to remain neutral. I'm not going to be, because I know there's a lot of people who agree with this. There's a lot of people who don't. So I'm going to take the neutral view and give you both sides. Um, but the five points, yeah, T stands for total depravity. U, unconditional election. L, limited atonement. That's the one people tend to have an issue with. I, irresistible grace, and L, or excuse me, P, sorry, uh, perseverance of the saints. So in, just in full disclosure, the Morris Corner Church doctrinal statement, we do have the T in total depravity in our church's doctrinal statement. The rest are not addressed in our church's statement. Uh, what do you know, when you, when you read this, when you hear about this, what's your first impression? Any impressions? Positive, negative, somewhere in between? Uh, what do you think? Aaron? It kind of follows the, um, I don't know which you can have it, but the way to lead somebody to Christ. You remember the fact that we are born with total depravity. We have unconditional um, love from God. We have to accept His atonement for ourselves, and that grace forgives us of our sins, and we are to persevere in our. It just reminds me of that. Okay, Marcus. No contendere. <laughs> okay, I don't speak Spanish, so I think I know what you're saying, but. <laughs> So, T, total depravity, uh, this is often misunderstood. Sometimes it's called total inability. This is the idea that mankind does not have the ability within himself to submit himself to God. A person is dead in trespasses and sins. That's what Ephesians 2.1 says. And because you are dead, you are unable to produce spiritual life in yourself. You have to be born again by the Spirit of God. So total depravity says you cannot come to God on your own. You need God's grace and His uh, regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. That's opposed to people who believe that mankind, yes we're sinful, but we still have some goodness within us to be able to choose Christ. But the Calvinist, or at least the person who believes in total depravity, says, no, you, you have no goodness, and you are dead in trespasses, and so you cannot believe without God intervening. I mean, that's the idea. Any verses for total depravity? I mean, I think of Jeremiah, was it 17.9? 17, the, heart, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So some people say, you know, f just follow your heart. Well, that's not good advice. Some people don't. I mean, it depends on your heart. If, you, if your heart, if you're born again and you love God, following your heart and following Jesus might line up. 
but natural man, not, not so. So anyways, that's total depravity. And you know, some people would say that, well, even John Calvin didn't believe in this stuff. Well, I, I think he probably did, but uh, Calvin himself did not come up with this. This came, this was sort of a summarization of his teachings. Uh, next, unconditional election. Let's turn to a few verses here. Uh, Ephesians chapter one. I remember growing up, I, I never heard of the doctrine of election. Uh, the, the whole concept of election was completely foreign to me. I was probably 26 years old. I was listening to WLPV Christian radio and this guy I'd never heard of, R.C. Sproul came on the air and he was talking about the doctrine of election. And I'm like, what is this? I've, I've been going to church more or less my whole life. I've never heard about this. And it was, yeah, it was a real eye opener. But if you actually, if you actually look, the Bible does talk about God choosing because elect means what? If, if something is elect, it's chosen. Right, we have, an, we have elections in this country. No comments, okay, but. <laughs> we have elections where people choose whatever, the governor, the, the president. Uh, Ephesians 1, we'll just start in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with ever, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ, to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So in verse 4, you see that he, God, has chose us. And Paul's writing to believers, and he says, God has chosen you from when? Foundation. The foundation of the world. So before this, the foundation. Right, you're right. Before, from before the foundation of the world. So this is called the doctrine of election, what the Bible teaches about God choosing. And you can see it in the name, God's choice, according to these five points, God's choice is unconditional, meaning he didn't make that choice based on anything to do with you. If you look at this, it says in verse 5, after God chose, he predestined, and it was all according to, yeah, it wasn't according to he saw something wonderful in you. No, it says it was all according to the good pleasure of, of his will. So this is the idea that God's choosing is based on God, not, not you. Okay, what's the argument against that? The well, low contender. I mean, some uh, are elect, some aren't. Yeah. I don't, wish to dis, I don't wish to debate. Some people would say that the, yes, God does choose. It's in the Bible. You can't really get around that. But they would say that, no, it, it is conditional. So the other side would say God's choosing is conditional based on his foreknowledge, which in Romans chapter, let's go to Romans 8. They would say it's based on his foreknowledge. Basically, God looks down the corridor of time and he sees in advance, he sees that this person and this person will believe in Christ. And based on that foreknowledge, knowing that this person will place their faith in Jesus, God elects them or chooses them based on knowing that they'll believe. Um, speaking of R.C. Sproul, uh, he commented on that. And he said that is, according to him, who he is a Calvinist, he said that's not an explanation of election. He said that's a fundamental denial of election. But again, that's, that's the disagreement that people have. Uh, Romans chapter 8, I told you to turn to, well, let's look at verses 28 through 30. Verse 28. All things work together for good. Amen. Is my, my favorite verse, I think, in all of the Bible. 
Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and quote oh, it for us. Oh, yes. All things work together for good to them that believe. Um, to them that love God. See, we put them on the spot. And then he, <laughs> yeah. I'll just read it. And, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So the idea is that God foreknew his people, and because he knew you would believe in Christ, that's why he chose you. So anyways, that's the difference between unconditional election, God chooses based on his will, nothing to do with you, or God chooses you based on what he knows about you. So you can be a good Christian on both sides. You know, I think here's where I take issue when people start throwing the term heresy around for this subject. I, I, I don't think that's called for. You can be a Calvinist or a non-Calvinist, and this is one of those things we can agree to disagree on. Denying the resurrection of Jesus, that's heresy. Mm -hmm. Denying, you know, that people have to believe in Jesus. Everyone's going to heaven no matter what. You don't even need to believe in Jesus. That's heresy. Calvinism is not heresy. If you disagree with it, hey, fine. Or if you accept it, fine. But it's one of those things that Christians, we can still get along and have a different viewpoint. Larry. Doesn't it, if God were to look down the corridor of time and see what I was going to do and chose because of that, doesn't it still, it's about me then, not God. So it's about my work, I mean, not God's. That's one of the arguments. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't personally think it really helps explain. It makes sense in some ways, but then it creates other questions. Yeah. Yes, and a question, not a comment. Okay. What is the difference between uh, false teaching and heresy or... I mean, heresy, you... Well, I'm starting to answer the question. You understand... Makes it easier Here's for me a, if I'm you answer. I'm trying to phrase the question correctly. Does heresy, is that a, does that stand in a category of its own other than, well, obviously other than differences of opinion? I think it stands in a category is all Is it the same own. as false teaching? It can be, the two can be used as synonyms. Okay. But not always. There are some people that I might feel comfortable calling them false teachers, but I would not want to call them. Heretic is like, that's like the final, that's the end of the road. That's yeah. like, so heresy, the best way to define heresy is it's a teaching that fundamentally denies or corrupts something to do with the person and work of Christ or the person of God, the nature of God. So denying the resurrection is heresy. Some of these woke pastors that are preaching critical race theory, and they're saying that there is one guy, former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, his, his, church, his church was too white. He wanted to get the, the numbers up, and he's pre preaching all this racial stuff, and we got to get 25% of the people uh, in our churches to be minorities. And I mean, if, any, if this was swapped around, it would be considered racism, right? So anyways, if you're preaching critical race theory, I would say that's false teaching. I think that pastor engages in false teaching with that stuff, the woke stuff. I'm, re I'm reluctant to call it heresy, though. I mean, maybe it is, but... Heresy is like the worst, and it's clearly denying the gospel. If someone's a heretic, they're not saved. The false person engaging in false teaching, they might be saved, but, I mean, they just need to be rebuked. So I think there is a, a difference. Yeah. When I have my hand up, it's because I have a word that, so I can remember when it's my turn to speak. The okay. word is deconstruction. Yep. My question is, please comment briefly then on deconstruction. Deconstruction, what it's, it is what it sounds like if you're deconstructing something. Let's say you have your faith 
you believe in Jesus. He died on the cross for my sins. He rose again. I'm a Christian. You have your faith and then you're starting to deconstruct it. Well, I don't believe Jesus. I don't believe this anymore. I don't believe what Jesus said here. I don't believe this. And you're just sort of dismantling your faith until you have nothing left. So deconstruction is when a person falls away from the faith. Sometimes they will then call themselves, uh, themselves an atheist. Sometimes they still say, well, I'm still a Christian. I just don't yeah. believe that stuff. And it's like, what, Christianity? Like, <laughs> but that's what, it, it's another word for apostasy, Aaron. The danger of the term deconstruction is it sounds like a really good thing. I mean, to take apart your faith and look at it and examine it closely in light of what I believe in these things. What is, the, what is it about this that is really examine why. I mean, the problem is that a lot of people in the church came to Christ as young children, and they just went along with it because it's what they were taught. And so looking at why we personally believe it is a really good thing. Yeah. And it's not like it's not that it's not the right thing to believe. It's just that we have to look at it and say, okay, it's when you look at it to say, okay, well, what parts that I were taught from the Bible are wrong? That's when you fall into apostasy. But it's really it's very deceptive, and that's the, the danger of the lie, is, you know, this word, deconstruction, sounds like such a good idea. <laughs> yeah, well, it doesn't sound good to me, but I don't... Well, no, just the act of examining your faith. Yeah, if that's how you're phrasing it, if that's how you're that's defining it... Deconstruction means in a lot of different disciplines. Yeah, yeah. Like, you, if you're deconstructing your business, you're examining why do we do the practice okay. that we do, you know... And so they look at that and then they, so people are deceived by it thinking it's that kind of a good thing and they right. realize they're falling into a cult. Right. Yeah. Obviously, if you were brought up being taught things that are wrong, you would want to examine those things and leave it behind. But the deconstruction Marcus is talking about that we've been dealing with recently is, is different. I mean, they're just dropping the fundamentals of the faith is what they're yeah yeah thanks okay so um we covered t total depravity sometimes called and th this is a misleading term because it makes it sound like people are as bad as they can possibly be that's not what total depravity means it means people are as bad off as they can be totally unable to remedy their lost conditions so a better term uh, would be radical corruption because of sin. Unconditional election, sometimes it's called sovereign election, but it's the difference people have between God choosing for his own purposes or based on what he sees uh, from man. The, the, we'll just skip limited atonement and come back to that, okay? The argument would be logically, if you believe this, then you should believe this. And if you believe this and this, then you would logically have to believe it. it is a system that is, the strength of it is its logic. Mm -hmm. So if you accept the first point, logically you would have to accept the rest. But again, not everyone agrees with that. I agree with that. Um, irresistible grace. That is another misnomer because it sounds like people cannot resist the grace of God. In reality, people are resisting God's grace all the time, everywhere. Matter of fact, I think Stephen, before he was stoned, preaching to the Jewish uh, leaders, he said, you always resist the Holy Spirit. I mean, you're resisting the grace of God. So basically, a better term for that would be the effectual call. Uh, irresistible grace is the idea that if God wants to save somebody, he can save them. So, if God chooses someone from the foundation of the world, at a point in time, the Holy Spirit will regenerate their dead spirit and they will come to faith because God can save whoever He wants. And this is the main difference between Calvinism and non-Calvinists. This is, this is, it all boils down to this. Why are you saved? Why are you saved? Are you saved because... Jesus saved you, God reached down, he saved you, or are you saved because you believed? Which is it? Are you saved because you believed, or are you saved because God saved you? Which is it? <laughs> People say, well, it's not either or, it's both. It's a, co it's a cooperative effort. God did, did his part, 
and I did my part. That's the free, we're talking about free will, right? Oh, that, but that's the free will position. God did his part, I did my part. It's like you're, you're drowning in the sea and God throws the life preserver and you, you grabbed onto it and that's how you are saved. The Calvinist position is God dives in the water and drags you onto the boat and saves your life. So again, two different viewpoints, Marcus. Do you like R.C. Sproul? Do you like John Calvin? Do you like... John MacArthur. John, what did I say? John, John Calvin. Calvin. Well, you yeah. like John Calvin too, don't you? Be honest with you, I've never, honestly, I've, I have read very little of John Calvin, so. Oh, okay. Do you like Erwin Lutzer? Yep. He has an excellent book that doesn't necessarily, and Larry can, I think he's more familiar with the book than I am. It's one of those that I want to read called Doctrines That Divide. Well, this is one of them. <laughs> this, this is a doctrine that divides. Yeah. But, that, but that's why I say you can take either side. You can be a, a member in good standing of Morris Corner Church and be a Calvinist. You can be a member in good standing and not be a Calvinist. What we don't want to do is start, you know, fighting and be at each other's throat over it. That's, that's what we don't want. Yeah. Comment now. I've noticed okay. that, and I'm glad that you have, you, you used to, you say it was Calvinism versus Arminianism. And of course, Arminianism has things I disagree with, and uh, and so I'm I like well, non-Calvinist. Well, I guess I'm a non-Calvinist and a non-Arminianist. Okay. So I guess I'm non-both. Yeah. Let's turn to First Corinthians chapter 15, but that would be the other side. Right? There's Calvinism, stressing the sovereignty of God. God does all the work in salvation, named after John Calvin. The other side is more free will. Uh, that's named after Jacob Arminius. So man does his part in believing, and you believe because you have the ability to believe. So these are two opposite systems. And... You know, lo again, logically, I would think people would fit into one of the other, but there's a lot of people say, hey, don't, don't, I don't want this label. I don't want this label. I don't fall into either camp. I, th I tend to think people do, but that's just my opinion. I'm not going to fight about it, but yeah. Obviously, pe some people don't like labels, and I think we need to respect people, and if they don't want to be called by a certain label, that's, that's fine. But I like, I like Christian. Christian is good. And that's why I get angry at heretics that say, oh, I'm just here because I want Christian fellowship. Well, you can't be a heretic and have fellowship any more than light and darkness. That's true. That's true. Okay, so irresistible grace, we talked about that. Now, P, perseverance of the saints. Uh, where is this taught in the Bible? Uh, I'm just going to say I've been on record and I'll... I'll sink or swim on this. I believe in total depravity, and I've preached on that, and I believe in perseverance of the saints, and I've preached on that. In between, you know, I intentionally, for, for reasons that I keep to myself, I, I, I tend to want to just remain more neutral on these, although I do have an opinion. But again, I'm trying to present this in a neutral way. But I, I do believe in the perseverance of the saints. I strongly believe in that. So why? Second uh, Corinthians five seventeen. Yep, that's a good one. But we're going to read First Corinthians fifteen, starting in verse one. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So this is the clearest definition of the Gospel anywhere in the Bible. The Gospel is Jesus died and rose again according to the Word of God. But you notice that a person is saved, Paul says, verse 2, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you. 
So there's an idea out there, once saved, always saved, which I think is true. The statement is true. But some people have the idea if, yeah, once saved, always saved. So as long as I say a sinner's prayer, I'm saved. And if I end up an atheist when I'm 60 years old, I'm still saved. No, if, if you're an atheist, you're not. If you fall away from the faith, you're not saved. This is the idea that a true believer will keep the faith. A true believer in Christ will persevere. Now, the, the word persevere makes it sound like you're the one who's doing it because of your determination, because of your strength. It's not really because of you, though. right? John chapter 10, Jesus, he, he holds us. God holds us in his hand, right? So it's better to call, I think, the preservation of the saints, that God preserves us. But it's basically the idea of eternal security, that a true believer will never lose their salvation, but the mark of the true believer is they keep the faith. So, yes, if someone ends up denying Christ at the end of their life, it's just evidence they were never truly regenerate to begin with. And that's the point uh, in Arminianism that I believe is false. Yes. Um, that you can lose your salvation. That's right. That's why I, again, whether you're a Calvinist or not, whether you find that helpful or not, Arminianism, I, I believe, is absolutely wrong because they believe you can lose your salvation. Well, I don't believe that for one second. And we could go back to Romans chapter 8 where Paul stresses the end of the chapter, nothing in all of creation can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Oh, except if you, if you do this or you commit this sin. Or, no. Yes, once a person is saved, they, they will always be saved. Okay, um, so that's the five points. Then limited atonement. Oh, man, rats, we're out of time, you know. No, this, I won't do that to you. Uh, this is the idea that Jesus came to die for the elect. Jesus didn't die for everybody. Because if Jesus died, let's say Jesus died for the sins. Well, what's it called? Limited atonement. Did Jesus atone for Adolf Hitler's sins? <laughs> the idea is if Jesus atoned for the sins of every human being on earth, then guess what? Every human being on earth is saved. Yes or no? Is Calvinist or non-Calvinist? Yes or no? Uh, some people prefer definite atonement. When Jesus died, that atonement was for the covenant people. It's like when the Passover lamb was slain. It wasn't for the Egyptians. It was for everybody in the covenant. Or, excuse me, the day of atonement in in Israel, when the high priest would sacrifice the lamb, the Day of Atonement, it wasn't for the Hittites. It was for God's covenant people. So when Jesus died, it wasn't for the heathen. It was for the elect. And then the other, the other side says all these verses that, well, he died not for our sins only, 1 John 2, 2, but for the sins of the whole world. It's, it's unlimited. And then the Calvinists would say, yes, but world means... You know, humanity in general, you know, and then the back and forth starts. But we're out of time, so if anyone has anything else on that, I'm sorry. You just... Cosmos. Yes. All right. Thank you. You're dismissed. Uh